shine a big light on me to kill everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I know there's a small crowd, and so it's more of a conversational thing rather than a big, huge thing, because uh, we were expecting a lot of people, but maybe it was the weather, or maybe it was some scary subconscious protest about hearing anybody <laughs> that might have a worldview differently than the average guy and still teaches physics. Why didn't they fire this guy yet? Well, first thing I want to tell you is I'm part of a place called Veritas Exchange. It's a group of scientists and a bunch of educators and uh, students and pretty much anybody who wants to chill and talk. Sometimes we meet on our deck and sometimes we meet at Applebee's. Lots of time we meet at Applebee's. And what we do is we just share ideas and we welcome people that have different worldviews and different ways of looking at things and we just share ideas, which is really what an education should be like. And that's what my talk is today. It's like the difference between an education and what somehow is being it turning into. Even at RIT, you know, you might not be getting the true education that you would have expected. All right? So I just want to show that to you, that, that Veritas Exchange is, is uh, a group of, of these guys and girls that just get together, and, and Veritas means the truth. So we're looking for it. We're looking for the truth. And as a scientist, that's what I want to do, you know? And a good scientist and third grader are really good at that. Like, why, why, why? And so a uh, good scientist, the one who hasn't lost that heart of a, a third grader. Third graders are good. Third graders are the best, OK? So this is a pretty obnoxious title. I was hoping you would notice it. <laughs> it was <laughs> trying to get people's attention. Uh, it's not religion versus science. No matter what Bill Nye and Ken Ham say, uh, it's not a religion versus science thing. I, I really do believe that we've been kind of duped in the last 50 years to think that there's this war going on between true operational science and somebody who might have a religious belief. Religion's not necessarily bad, even though it's gotten a really bad name, you know, through crusades and people flying airplanes into buildings and a lot of sick stuff that goes on in the name of their God or our God or whoever's God. But that's not how it really worked until about 50 years ago. Before that, they were coexisting quite well because there was a whole lot of scientists doing a whole lot of cool science that had faith, you know? Uh, Muslim faith, Christian faith, Judeo-Christian Judeo faith. There was a lot of people getting a lot done that were faithful. And lately, it's like this bad word. So somebody made this weird rule up that if you were a true scientist, you can't believe in God. And that's a bully mentality that happened about 40, 50 years ago. I'm actually old enough to know that that's recent. But you guys have grown up in a culture, if you're in RIT right now, that don't know that. You actually think, because of your professors and because of people that have been telling you this, that uh, if you are a scientist, you must have a naturalistic explanation for everything. And if you don't have a naturalistic explanation of anything, you're some kind of Jesus freak or, or religious nut. And that's not true. I got to be really clear about that. That is seriously not true. I teach physics. And my physics book is pretty much written, even though the author says night. <laughs> uh, it's been written by Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, and Pascal. And they were all born again young earth creationists. Young earth, you hear that? Ooh, those are those crazy guys like Ken Ham, right? <laughs> they wrote my book. Would they be allowed to teach at RIT? Uh, ask me that during the question and answer session. I don't know if they would be allowed to get tenure here. It's kind of spooky that Newton wouldn't be able to get tenure here. Now, that's a judgment on my part, but I've had some evidence recently that indicated that just might be true. And that's kind of sad, because that's not what this place was supposed to be, and that's not how Princeton and Yale was supposed to be. So it's a little disconcerting when you experience that as a professor of physics to have people uh, do that. That's pretty annoying. Okay, don't look down and breathe. Okay, so there you go. Why am I here? Well, is naturalism good science or is it a religion? That's pretty much the question on the thing. So what I want to do is see whether or not we could do it. Here's, my name is Professor Leonard Tenzi. I hang out at Finger Lakes Community College teaching, like uh, Greg said, calculus-based physics to a bunch of engineers that may or may not show up at RIT someday. Okay, and what I want to do is just give a quick introduction and uh, then define science. The way I, I perceive science, I actually stole it out of the dictionary, so I bet you a few people will agree with me. And then why we're here at RIT. Tonight I'm going to talk, and then next week, boy, and I hope you show up next week, Dr. Sanford from Cornell, who 
when you eat a watermelon without seeds, this is the dude that figured out how to do stuff like that. All right? And he's, he's, he actually invented the gene gun that actually can get things to be genetically engineered so that we get it better or more resistant to bacteria or germs. I mean, it's the coolest thing. So if you come next week, I'm hoping you do. Dr. Sanford is just awesome. And, uh, and then the week after that, uh, Jeremy Stid uh, will speak more about a philosophical way instead of more of a scientific way. So um, this week it's uh, me, and next week Dr. Sanford, and I'm hoping you make it for all three if you can. Bring your friends, okay? So um, we're going to define religion or worldviews or paradigms. That'll be threaded throughout my talk. And then uh, hopefully discuss some examples of some worldviews or maybe kind of give it like a little scientific experiment with what way you would lean if I gave you a story or gave you a scenario. Okay? And there you go. So that's what we're going to do. All right. So let's start. Uh, I was born a short, bald Italian guy. <laughs> and then uh, I experimented with hair in middle school and then uh, lots of hair in high school. And then I'm still now a short, bald Italian guy. So it's, it's the circle of life, man. Give me a break. All right? So um, one thing that you might know about me is that I just love science. I mean, talk about nerd. Here, let me go back one, because I lost it. Um, uh, that's me winning the science fair in sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade uh, with an astronaut suit that I stole with tinfoil. And then there's me now. I haven't changed much. <laughs> that's me with a Tesla coil that's lighting up a fluorescent too. I just love science. I mean, science is so cool. All right? I do it all day. I tell people about it. I get people's eyes to light up when I'm telling them all this cool stuff. And uh, it's really a neat job. And I'm, what I'm seeing lately, it's kind of deteriorating on what real science was supposed to be and what it is, you know, and what it should have been or what it was before. Okay? So um, let me just see if I can tweak this thing again. Um, here's the definition of science from the dictionary. It means to know. It's a systematic knowledge derived from, ready for this? Observation and study. Okay? So the whole intent of science was to observe with your eyes, with your senses, and then come up with a cool explanation on why things are the way they are. That was the goal. Okay? It's always been the goal. Galileo, he said, the whole universe is like the biggest sandbox God ever could make, and I just want to know what the rules are. That's what his whole intent was. He didn't want to be like Socrates and Aristotle. The Greek philosophy is this. Discuss. Put forth an idea. Like Aristotle. Anything at rest wants to remain at rest. Anything in motion wants to come to rest. Now, wait a minute. That's not what I learned. Well, that's because Aristotle said that, and everybody went, hmm. Anybody refute that? No? Okay, it's truth until somebody can come up with a better explanation. See, nobody tested it. They all sat around with their robes on talking about it, but nobody did anything about it, right? That's why I'm writing a book on the scientific method because I want people to know that the original Greek philosophers were philosophers. They didn't really get their hands dirty with stuff. They just spewed stuff out, and if nobody argued with them, it was truth. And Aristotle was the man, you know? He got the grant money, he got the funding, you know. <laughs> he was the one that everybody looked at and said, Aristotle's the man. If somebody dared say something contrary to him, they better back it up with some better logic. Not observations, not study, argument. See the Greek idea? So here comes Galileo, this crazy born-again creationist, <laughs> and he said, you know, I think, because of his worldview, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you the story. His worldview said there's a logical, moral, absolute God. And therefore, just like he believes in absolute moral law, Galileo said, I believe God created absolute physical laws, truths, that if it worked here on Earth, it would probably work on another planet. If Things fall here, they probably fall maybe differently, but they're going to have gravity everywhere. Newton embraced it too. Newton said, I could even put these in the laws of gravity and laws of motion. And he was inspired by 
an absolute truth. You see, the Greek philosophy was, well, the gods might change their mind tomorrow, and gravity might be different tomorrow. We don't know. You know how they are. <laughs> you know, Zeus and stuff. Well, Galileo believed in absolutes and absolute truths. Now, you may or may not believe in that, but he did. So you've got to respect the guy who created the scientific method <laughs> as he was motivated by his belief systems to come up with a system of testing and observation to get to a place where you actually found out how it works. Why it works, that's religion. But how it works, he's going to find a rule book out. And that's what I want people to do. That's what I inspire my students to do. And if there's a full house of RIT students, I would have said the same thing that I'm saying to you guys. And that is, I want you to look for ways to find the truth. And that's why Veritas is a cool name for our little organization. Okay? Even Al Einstein from my tie said, I want to know all God's thoughts. And that's pretty good for an agnostic. <laughs> all the rest are just details. Okay? All right. <laughs> I spawned this cartoon the other day. I loved it. Conventional logic? Ah, I have a baseball. Yeah, prove it. Here. Oh, you're right. Really religious logic. See? Slamming people like me, right? I have a baseball. I has a baseball. See how funny that is? Okay? Oh, yeah, prove it. You can't prove that I don't. All right? Isn't that pretty obnoxious? Okay? Now, if you were slightly religious right now, you'd be totally offended. If you were a naturalist, you'd go, yeah, see? <laughs> What's scary is, after this talk, you might find out you're way more religious than you thought, because I know a lot of people who are naturalists that when I tell them, but do you have any evidence, any observational evidence, anything that can, you can test, anything you can falsify that indicates anything about what you believe? Well, prove I don't! Ah, you know, and I get that a lot, mostly from religious people. And some of the religious people don't know they're religious because they subscribe to a naturalistic worldview. And boy, do they get mad when I mess with their brain about it. Okay? So if I offend you, that's okay. We'll still go out and get Applebee's and I'll buy you dinner. Okay? So here goes. <laughs> if this still works. Um, the word evolution. Why don't we just start getting right into it? You've heard this word all the time. Sometimes that word represents cosmic evolution, like the origin of time and space and matter, like the Big Bang. That's what they use, the evolution of the stars and evolution of galaxies, okay? Another time they use the word evolution is chemical evolution, starting from a bunch of chemicals and the lightning hit the methane and ammonia and out popped a cell, okay? Another thing that they talk about, stellular, planetary evolution. I hear that word in astronomy class. I teach astronomy, so sometimes I actually use that word about how it changed over time and what's happening in the age of a star and how planets might or might not have formed, okay? By the way, nobody's actually seen a star form. So keeping that in the back of your mind, whether it's observable science or whether or not it's conjecture, okay? Next one, organic evolution. You've probably heard that, where out of nothing came the first maybe RNA, messenger RNA, and somehow that evolved into DNA and then the cytoplasm that was just two lipid layers surrounded it and became the first living cell. And out of that came multiple cellular animals, and out of that came there. The last one is that macroevolution, changing from one kind of animal to another kind of animal, or one kind of plant to another kind of plant. That's the stuff. That's the wording that you'll hear. So what turns a frog into a prince? Just millions and millions of years. You don't need a kiss from the princess just a lot of time. Okay? And you've learned this. Trust me, some of you guys believe it wholeheartedly, and I'm going to scare you when I say this, but some of you believe it religiously, and I don't blame you a bit. You've been since five years old hearing this eight hours a day in school for five days a week since you were five. Right? If your parents brought you to Sunday school, you heard a bunch, a bunch of stories for a half hour once a week until your parents got bored and stopped bringing you. So you have been absolutely bombarded by that. And so if you believe it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised a bit. I was an atheist and agnostic all the way through college, man. I was majoring in physics. That makes me smart, smarter than these religious people, right? I mean, you know, Francis Bacon, the other guy who did the scientific method, said it best. A little bit of religion, I'm sorry, a little bit of science made me become an atheist. A lot of science 
brought me back to my knees. It was really kind of cool. A little bit of science made me an atheist. A lot of science brought me back. So when I was in college, well, you guys know, you're teenagers, you know everything. So <laughs> when you're in college, you know everything. So you have a tendency to latch on to that good feeling you get by being smarter than parents and smarter than you know, professors. You know. And so you got to watch it. You got to watch your pride a little bit and realize that you might have a lot to learn. And I didn't. I was a jerk. And then <laughs> I got older and I realized, wow, I don't really know very much at all. All I did was learn what I didn't know. Okay? So macroevolution. Be careful about that one. The last one is the evolution of morality, your consciousness from mere animal. That sounds philosophical, so Jeremy Stitt will probably handle that on the third week. Right now, I want to point out one thing that might bother some of you, and that's okay. All right? I told you. I'll still buy you lunch at Applebee's sometime. Okay? Microevolution. I don't even like the word, but I want to point out to you that you'll hear this word a lot. Microevolution is variations within a kind of animal, like a wolf. I mean, a coyote is a variation on that, and so is a fox. And so, get ready, is a chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, they're all a wolf. How do you know? Well, if you could talk them into it, you can breed a chihuahua with a wolf, and you'll get puppies. <laughs> it's the same kind of animal. We've been messing with them for like four or 5,000 years, and, <laughs> and they're still wolves. They're just ugly, <laughs> you know? And you need Paris Hilton to take care of them sometime, you know? So it, it's just a wolf. Very weird wolf that can't live without uh, booties and a little uh, hat, okay? All right, this is going to bother some people, but that's okay. This is science. So if anybody says, I want to go see this professor at Finger Lakes, he came here and he said that there's no such thing as evolution. Evolution is not good science. Hello. Those six are not testable. Those six are conjectures. Those six are not observable. You can hypothesize all you want, but you can't say it's a fact. I'm sorry, but this is the rules of science due to the scientific method. Okay? The last one's been observed. So don't go telling anybody, oh, he doesn't believe in natural selection. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, he doesn't believe in mutations. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, he doesn't believe in evolution. Whoa, hold on. You know, what definition are you talking about before I say I don't believe in it? I believe in evolution. Change over time. Oh, absolutely. Hello, chihuahua, wolf, I definitely positively believe in evolution. Rock pigeon to pheasant <laughs> with feather colors. And, oh, my goodness. So much variation over time. There's so much evolution going around around us. But be careful next time. Here's an assignment for you. Look in your bio book. Look in your bio book and see what their definition of evolution is. And then watch the bait and switch. You know what a bait and switch is? They teach you one word and then prove it's true, and then they switch the definition on you in the middle. Careful. Careful they do that to you. That's not fair. You're here to be educated and you're paying a ton of money. Be careful if somebody does that to you. You don't want them to do that to you. Don't do the bait and switch. So here's what the bait and switch would be. They talk about this until you're convinced there's change over time, until you're convinced there's five different species of finch, until you're convinced that there's all these different variations. And then when, you got, when they got you, yep, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact. Therefore, given enough time, a single cell can turn into me. From goo to you via the zoo, fact. See, I proved it. Ah, no, you didn't. You changed the word. It's not fair. You shouldn't do that. Okay? I'm a scientist. I'm also, apparently, the scientific police lately. I'm saying, nope, can't do that. Nope, that's not against the rules. Nope, don't do that. And I'm talking to bio professors. I'm pissing them off. But God, I'm calling them on that. You can't do that. That's against the rules. Stick to the definition. This is a philosophy. This has never been observed. If you dare come next week with Dr. Sanford, you're going to talk to a geneticist who wrote a book that got him in a lot of trouble <laughs> because he had to tell the truth. And the truth was, all his evidence says we're going down, not up. Given enough time, everything goes to extinction. Given enough time, it goes down, not up. There has been no mechanism for it to get better. Even beneficial mutations are outnumbered a million to one. It ain't getting better. 
okay? You might not have heard that in bio class, and if you haven't, I'm sorry. Your worldview might piss you off right now that I said that. I'm sorry. But it's the truth. It's not observable. If you still believe it, that's okay. But admit it's religious, and we'll go have a beer when you're 21, okay? But right now, you got to be honest. I'm being honest. And that sometimes bugs people who are religious, even if they didn't know they were religious, because I'm messing with their worldview because they thought they were a scientific naturalist. Mm. I don't know. Okay, so those are religious, non-science, non-testable, non-falsifiable stuff. And the last one is real science. Don't let them fool you with the vocabulary. Okay? All right, real quick. Why are we here at RIT? Who am I? <laughs> what am I worth? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? I hope you stay and just talk with us. Man, we got a little panel of people that are part of Veritas Exchange, so that when this is over, come down real close and we'll just sit here and we'll have a discussion. You can ask us any questions about whatever. Okay, scientific or our own beliefs, or you can share a little bit about your beliefs and ask a question about eh, why, why not? Well, what, you know, I would love it if you stayed and did that. That would be so cool, okay? You know, where am I going when I die is more important than you think. Sometimes when I was young, I don't know if this is happening to you, but I just pretty much thought I was bulletproof. You know, when I was in college, I never thought about death, you know? Well, now I'm getting old <laughs> and my knees are killing me. Yeah, I just had ankle operate, starting to think about it a little bit, like, wow, we're all going to die. I know that sounds weird, but uh, you, know, you got to think about that. Is it really, this is all it is? I'm going to teach calculus-based physics and then die. <laughs> you know, that's all there is, you know? Or is this just a pop quiz, man? Is this just a, the womb? Is what's coming even better? Those are really cool questions. More philosophical than, than science, because that's not testable. So hang around and talk to Jeremy. He's the philosopher, Okay. All right, so what do we got here? I spent a lot of time, and you probably could tell this, showing people that real science agrees with a biblical real view. Blows them away. They have been so indoctrinated to think that the biblical real view is just this really cool story, and there's no science at all in it, and you've got to shut your brain off, leave it at the door in order to believe in anything biblical. Now, I'm going to say that again real slow because I talk fast. I know fellow Christians who believe they have to shut their brain off at the door, leave it at the door, in order to have this blind faith in their belief system. Oh, how sad. And then I know people who have never read the book and never have read some really interesting things in there that pretty much explain stuff way better than the naturalistic model. I know them absolutely without ever reading it, totally dismiss it, because their professors said you're not a good scientist if you believe in a deity or a designer. That's sad too. So I get sad by a lot of people. <laughs> Christians who think blind faith is a good thing. Blind faith makes me nervous. Religious people make me nervous. Religious people fly airplanes into buildings. They make me nervous. I want people to think. I want people to reason. Believe it or not, my God from what I've read in the book, wants you to do that. Don't shut your brain off. Don't leave it at the door. Okay? So, I do that. <laughs> I spend all this time talking about that. And you know what? <laughs> I get nowhere a lot. I was trying to figure out why. I'm showing them all this evidence. And it doesn't work. It doesn't seem to change anybody's mind. And then it dawned on me. It's because they're not looking at evidence. They have a religious worldview. And I'm messing with it. You can't change somebody's worldview with evidence. They'll come up with a belief-saving device to always keep their belief in spite of your new evidence. Anybody watch the Bill Nye-Ken Ham debate? That was atrocious. I hated both of them. They did bad. You know why? Bill Nye was saying things that weren't true, as if they were. He was saying things that aren't facts, not in evidence, as if they were. He appealed to the majority of scientists as if scientific is a majority, right? If that was true, we would still have a earth in the center of the solar system because Copernicus, born-again Christian, was a ma minority on thinking the earth was just the third rock from the sun. That was not popular. The majority is not good in science sometimes. You don't get anything new, okay? So it's really kind of an interesting thing. 
It doesn't seem to change their mind. Why? Well, I'm going to offend somebody, maybe. Because you're religious. And I can't change a religious worldview with evidence. You'll find a belief-saving device. Every time. Every time. Okay? Christians do it. Non-Christians do it. Naturalists do it. All religions do it. You just didn't know naturalism was a religion. If you believe in something in spite of the evidence, you're religious. And that's what scares me. If you believe in something in spite of the evidence, you're religious in my horrendously judgmental attitude. Okay? I apologize. But I think you are. Okay, so here it goes. I was wondering why I didn't change my mind. Okay? All right. Maybe it's this. <laughs> maybe religion and Darwin, maybe it's always going to be this big battle. I just love that picture. It's so funny. They're battling again. All right? <laughs> Poor Jesus. Poor Darwin. I think Jesus is winning on that one. All right, so here's some of the things I end up talking about when I do these college talks and, and do this stuff. <clears throat> I end up speaking about things like DNA. Whoops. DNA, uh, uh, you know what that looked like. DNA is the coolest thing ever. I hope you come next week. That DNA is like this amazing software program. It's the most incredible operating system we know about. I'm going to quote Bill Gates, who's kind of an agnostic. Okay? Bill Gates is the most sophisticated operating system known to man and way beyond any of the abilities for man to come up with something close. Kind of a paraphrase, but he was pretty much saying he doesn't know how it got here, but it's way more sophisticated than Windows 8. And if you're a Mac person, you realize Windows 8's not that great. All right? So the point being, well, where'd it come from? Well, that's not in the realm of science. That's historical evidence. It's here. So you've got to work with different rule books on that one. We can conjecture all we want, but you can't honestly say in your heart, I know the answer to that question. Where did DNA come from? Not from a scientific point of view. From a faith point of view, I could say what I believe, and you could say what you believe. But from a scientific point of view, we are limited. We can't run the test. We don't have a video playing back and seeing how DNA showed up. You're on... If you believe it happened by lightning hitting soup, you're on the same keel as me. You have a faith, and you believe it wholeheartedly, and you'll defend it no matter what evidence I give you. That's what religious people do. Okay? Werner Gitz said this, There's no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. That's really interesting because DNA is, again, a software program, and a software program that puts the software programs we have to shame. So that's pretty annoying to know that. A lot of people just sidestep it and pretend they know how it happened. And if you read a bio book to eighth graders, see, they get them when they're eight. And eighth graders, you get them in eighth grade and convince them that there's an explanation on how DNA showed up. And by the time they get to high school, they think science has shown how DNA shows up. And when they get to college, they're arguing with me about how I'm not scientific, and they are. And they send me hate mail. It's like, really? That's not science. It's you're religious, and you're really loud about it. Okay? Okay. So he said something else, too. What else did he say? When its progress along the chain of transmissional events is traced way backward, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. Ooh, that would bother people. I'm saying something that should mess with some people's worldview. You don't get information without the sender of information. You don't get language without a pre-agreed upon discussion that these sounds I'm making right now make sense to some of you, <laughs> unless you had lectured all day with your, your teachers and your brain dead. But the, this sound I'm making makes sense to you because, just because, we already had a pre agreed arrangement, believe it or not, when you learn English, that these sounds are going to mean this, and Shabbat the Buddha isn't going to mean much. Maybe in another language that would have. Get it? You've got to have a sender and a receiver of the information, and therefore you have to have intelligence on both ends. And that bothers people when they see DNA is a 3.1 gigabyte hard drive, an entire library that's 7.1 feet long, one thousandth the thickness of a human hair, all raveled up in a little brown spot in my skin cell, and it doesn't tangle. If you've ever gone fishing, you know how amazing that is, right? And then 
if you have a cell membrane breakdown, what do you do? You send a message, hey, we've got a cell membrane broke down, and this little nano robot comes out and goes in through a special key into the nucleus, finds that spot on the DNA library in reference. It's the reference file. You're not allowed to take stuff out of DNA. It's uh, the reference file. You go up there and you go, hey, we need cell membrane protein. And he goes, oh, it's uh, row 12. And then you go over row 12 with this little robot, and it unzips that part of the DNA that's coding for the protein, and then the RNA makes a Xerox copy of it so that the actual blueprint never leaves the nucleus, and then it zips it back up, and this little Xerox copy messenger RNA comes back through the doorway through the special key so bugs can't get in, and then it goes into the cytoplasm, goes to the ribosome, which is big manufacturing plant for proteins, and the little code goes, okay, we need this amino acid. All right, that letter means this. This letter, according to our language, means this, and then this letter means this. Okay, we can add them all up together, and when they're all together, oh, we got ourselves a chain of amino acids that will, will curl just right to become a cell membrane. And then a bunch of nanobots go over there and bring it to the part of the cell membrane that was damaged. Whoa, you wish human beings could come up with something like that. You know how long that took? The time it took for me to explain it. One of my skin cells did that. That's impressive, <laughs> all right? You can't explain how that happens. You can't explain what originated the software program for that happens. You can conjecture, but you can't test it or approve it. Nobody can, even me, okay? All right, so um, observational science, okay? I'm flipping past here, sorry. Observational science kind of confirms that there was some intelligence beyond DNA. Evolutionary models, they don't confirm it. They have no explanation. So a lot of people get uncomfortable with this. Well, well, you're just doing God of the gaps, man. You're just saying, we don't know how it works, so God did it. No, no. All observational science says that when you get a software program, <laughs> Bill Gates hires somebody to drive it, write it. All observational science points to an intelligence when you have a software program. So the minute you show up with a software program, my scientific brain says, well, somebody made that. You might not like that. You might not think it's scientific, but that's better than soup did it on its own. Cause and effect, man, I teach physics. F equals MA, forces cause accelerations. You can't tell me you can get language without intelligence. I've never observed it. Observable science says that if you have language, you have intelligence. Well, I got language called DNA. I got intelligence. Okay? Come next week. Maybe you'll hear more about that. Okay? All point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. That's a scary thought. That means it's down, not up. That means after a lot of time, you end up with less information, not more. So the whole model of getting better with time, actually time is the enemy of what observations have shown you. You have to believe, in spite of the evidence, that given enough time when nobody was looking, things went from one-celled animals and went up. You have to believe that in spite of observations. Observational evidence, it's going downhill. You have to believe the minute scientists started looking, it went downhill. But before we knew about it, it was going uphill. With no model or any explanation, and how come it went uphill when nobody was looking, but now it's going downhill when all the scientists are looking? That should bug you if your worldview just did it. Here's a couple quotes by Dr. Sanford, Cornell professor. Mutations are word processing errors in the cell's instruction manual. Mutations systematically destroy genetic information. Okay? Stole this out of his book. So if you get a chance, look that over. I'm running out of time, so I want to just kind of throw a few more things out. Selection, natural selection, it slows down the mutational degradation, but it doesn't even begin to actually stop it. So even with intense selection, evolution is still going the wrong way toward extinction. That was profound. Got him a lot of trouble when he said that, but he had to be honest enough as a scientist to tell the truth. Okay? Hey, here's another one I talk about, carbon-14 and diamonds. There shouldn't be any carbon-14 and diamonds. Right? So I show this to people and go, hey, Carbon-14 and diamonds. If you're using one dating method, it's a billion years old. If you use carbon-14, it's 10,000 years old. Which one are you going to pick? 
uh, the one that agrees with my worldview. Oh, so you're going to ignore some evidence that doesn't agree with your religion. Is that science? No, that's religion. Sorry. But if there's carbon-14 in the diamond, you can't come up with an explanation on why that's true. Oh, you should believe, you should hear the stories on why carbon-14 is still in diamonds. There's a belief-saving device for everything I share with my students. This isn't working. It's probably not working on you. Okay? Here's a few evidences that I actually lecture on that kind of show that the Earth might be younger than you think. Here's ways to date the Earth. There's 42 of them that I thought of <laughs> that kind of give indications that the Earth is young. Does this impress any students that are naturalistic in their worldview? Nope, not a bit. They got a belief-saving device for every single one of these things. They got explanations. They go to talk origins on the Internet, and they come up with an answer. It's crazy, but... They got an answer. It's not working at all. Matter of fact, for every one old Earth dating method, I can come up with 10 young Earth dating methods. Dr. Humphreys, an astrophysicist and astronomer, started actually counting how many dating methods we could use and which ones uh, were what I would consider to be uh, valid. And some of them are young and some of them are old. Which ones did you pick? The one that agreed with your worldview. By the way, Christians would do that too. They're guilty. They're guilty too. Everybody goes with whatever their worldview is. Okay? So, the observational science, like the Grand Canyon, will indicate that we had a major catastrophe that made all the sedimentary rocks everywhere. That goes against your worldview right now. You're already thinking of possible explanations on what you see. That can't be true. That can't be true. I heard they were millions of years. I heard that these layers took millions of years to form. Well, Grand Canyon, how long did it take for it to form? I don't know. I don't have a video camera. <laughs> I don't know how long it took to form. Do you? I did this once at St. John Fisher, and I said, how many years does that take to form? How many years does a canyon take to form? And some guy in the back yelled out, millions of years. And I said, well, how do you know it was millions of years? Were you there? And he said, radioactive dating. Ooh. I ought to put them Christians in their place. And I said, well, sir, I'm glad you brought that up. He thought he was just heckling me, but actually, I was glad he brought it up. And I said, radioactive dating is a method that's got four assumptions to it. And you have to believe by faith that those assumptions are something you can ignore the possibility that they're not right. Ask me during QA, I'll tell you the four assumptions. It's really kind of interesting. And I said, but even if radioactive dating was flawless, Flawless. You can't date sedimentary rock that way because radioactive dating works on when the rock was cooled off. When it was liquid, then it turned solid. And these rocks were layered <laughs> sometime other than that. We have no idea when they got layered. We just maybe know when they cooled off somewhere else. Get it? There's no evidence for the layering. There's no explanation for the layering over millions of years. But I do know how you make layers like that. I did it in earth science class. You take a graduated cylinder with five different stuff in there. You shake it up, up all over the water, sit it down, and by the time it would take me to finish explaining this, you'd see layers. It really happens nice underwater, and it looks a lot like that underwater. So I said to the guy, and this offended him, I think, because after I said it, he stormed out. But I said, if your college professor told you that you could date sedimentary rock layers and you instantly know how old this rock is, and that rock is a million years younger, and this is a rock is even and this got laid a million years later on top of that, he either is misinformed, using data from 40 years ago when his professor taught him, and he never bothered reading a new book, or he's blatantly lying to you so that he is trying to indoctrinate you in his worldview. And five people turned around and looked at my heckler, and it was the geology professor that made his students come to my talk to put holes in this crazy religious guy. And they all looked at him like, you can't date sedimentary rock with radioactivity? <laughs> and he walked out and stormed out. I'm making people mad. But, man, I owe it to you guys. Why am I here? <laughs> my voice is hoarse. I taught all day. Why am I here? 
because I want people to know that there's another possible explanation and it might be more scientific than what you knew. And that'll bother you because everybody's comfortable with their own worldview. So I'm going to ask you a question. Here's a quiz. How long did it take to make these sedimentary rock layers? In your heart of hearts, how long did that take? You got it? You got it in your mind? Did you say millions of years? It takes millions of years to make those layers? That's OK if you said it, but you might have heard it so much that you're just spewing it back at me. I forgot to tell you. I'm mad that I'm short and bald, so I have an anger streak in me that I'm trying to temper like crazy. I get, keep praying that God will heal me on that one. But I'm a jerk. Those three pictures you saw, that wasn't the Grand Canyon, it was Mount St. Helens. I have video that these sedimentary rock layers were laid down in, ready, week and a half, when Spirit Lake filled up to 1,000 feet higher than it was supposed to. All that stuff happened underwater. Fossils are forming at the bottom. Coal is forming at the bottom of Spirit Lake after 30 years. And now, the dam broke, and all the water rushed out and cut that canyon you saw. Cut that canyon through there. That canyon was formed in three hours, people. I got video. I mess with people's worldview, and it's okay. Don't be sad, okay? Sedimentary rock layers, how long does it take for them to form? Hours. <laughs> I got another one. Comets. I love comets. The Oort cloud is what they come up with for the belief saving device. Comets shouldn't be around anymore if the solar system is more than a couple hundred thousand, maybe 30,000 years, some people estimate. But they should be completely gone after 100,000 years. So why do we still have comets if the solar system is definitely positively four and a half billion years old? We shouldn't have comets anymore. They lose stuff every time they go around. So what do they do? They come up with a rescuing device or a belief saving device. Perhaps there's a vast reservoir of comets beyond the visible solar system. You know how far away they put the Oort cloud? 40 times farther than Pluto. You know why they put it out there? So we'll never find out if they're right. Do you remember that cartoon? Remember that cartoon? Religious outlook. I have a baseball. Oh yeah, prove it. You can't prove I can. What are they doing? What are they doing? They're hitting you with a belief system. That's not science. You can't find an astronomy book that doesn't describe the Oort cloud for two pages. Describing something they made up, and they can never test, and they never can falsify. That ain't science. That's not science. I miss science. That's a belief-saving device. I'm going to change the word rescuing device to belief-saving device, because it saves your belief. It also stands for BS device for short. Belief saving device. Sorry, sorry, I had to. Because your belief saving device is made up stuff. I said stuff, didn't I say stuff? I'm trying not to swear anymore. Okay, so here's the scoop. Some dude in a creation model sees the same evidence as this dude in the evolutionary worldview. They see in the same stuff. And then they're using their worldview to interpret it. And they're using their world to it. Neither are science. I'm freely going to admit it. <laughs> That's not science. Well, neither is that. Bill Nye, Ken Ham, that was not a scientific debate. I was disappointed in both of them because it wasn't a scientific debate, and I thought I was going to listen to a scientific debate. At the end of the debate, everybody who was a naturalist cheered because they asked Ken Ham, who's not a scientist, is there anything that could happen to have you change your belief? And he said, no, nothing. And then they asked Bill Nye, is there anything that could happen to change your belief? And Bill Nye wisely said for the crowd, sure, evidence. Now, everybody cheered. And some people in this room are right now, yeah, see? One was science, one was religion. No, you didn't pick the subtlety up. One told the truth. There's nothing that would change his belief because he admits it's a belief. The other one lied through his teeth. Yeah, show me evidence. Well, what if I showed him evidence? What would Bill Nye say? 
He'd have a belief-saving device for everyone. He lied. One told the truth, but you don't like the truth. And the other one lied and said he wasn't religious. He was a scientist. I'm Bill Nye, the science guy, with a BA in engineering. <laughs> he lied. He can't change his belief system either. He's stuck. He just doesn't admit he's religious, so he goes there claiming he's the science guy because it just doesn't rhyme. Bill Nye, the religious guy. It's just not true. No, 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 that's not me. I am scientific. Okay? So presuppositions are the problem. That's our belief system. Like reliability of senses, that's something we all agree is true. But this is philosophy, so we're going to skip through this stuff. But I just want to point out to you that creationists and evolutionists have different worldviews, different presuppositions, different rules for interpreting the evidence. And that's where the problem comes in. The evidence is the evidence. But the interpretation is not more scientific for this guy than that guy. Let me say it one more time. The evidence is the evidence. The fossil is the fossil. But you will see the fossil based on your worldview, not based on the actual evidence. That's not science. That's human worldviewness. <laughs> I gotta come up with a cool word for that. Okay? Evidence by itself will not resolve a worldview conflict. If somebody who's kind of like believes in the Holy Bible will look at that fossil and go, look, there's evidence the Bible is true. Some other guy from the other side will say, no, nope, I don't see it that way. It's a different worldview. Yeah, how about now? Grand Canyon. See, Mount St. Helens formed in hours. No, no, no. How about uh, how about Bryce Canyon? No, no, no. Oh, what, what about uh, the changes in life? No. How about DNA? No. How about how the solar system forming? It's so perfect. No. <laughs> you see, you can't solve it that way. So evidence by itself can't resolve it. It's not that people don't have enough evidence. It's just that your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. Are you with me? All right, I've repeated myself enough. So it's really not science versus religion, folks. It's religion versus religion. It's just two worldviews. It's in the beginning, God, or in the beginning, dirt. It made itself. The universe just happened on its own, a cosmic fart. <laughs> you know? and, and out of hyperspace came everything that we know, or there was some kind of designer or intent or first cause. Both are religious. It's just one won't admit it. One is saying that they're not religious, even though they're religious, and saying out of nothing came everything, but nothing made it happen. That's religious. You might not like it. Okay? So naturalism influenced the way you interpret the facts and the evidence. Other religions do the same thing. They just admit they're religious. So what you believe before you see the evidence affects your vision. Okay? So all these examples that we talked about, all your belief system is going to choose which one. Okay? Um, just an example. Let's say we had a T-Rex fossil. They found it in, I don't know, the state of Washington. Right? And they dug it up. And they cleaned it all off. And they tried to get it on the helicopter to take it to the museum. And it was too big to fit across uh, through the helicopter. Just a made-up story. Watch, I'm going to test you guys. I'm going to test your worldviews. Okay? All right? They can't get it aboard the helicopter, so they reluctantly have to cut the femur in half. Beautiful T-Rex specimen, but they got to ruin it a little bit. But they can't get it aboard the helicopter, so they got to do it. So they saw it in half. They look inside, and it's not pure rock. Fossils are supposed to be rocks. Used to look like bones, but they're actual rocks. But this fossil is hollow on the inside. There's bone marrow still in there. There's blood vessels still in there. When they dissolve the calcium coating on this stuff, it's stretchy and spongy. You get this story? That's a made-up story, right? I mean, that can't happen. But if it did happen, if it did happen, would you start questioning how old dinosaurs went extinct? I mean, I can picture this little conversation. You there, how old is that dinosaur? And then the guy says, this dinosaur is 65 million years, three months, and six days old. Eight days old. That's incredible. How can you be so accurate with the dating? Well, when I started here, the curator told me the dinosaur was 65 million years old, and I've been working here for three months and eight days. Thank you. All right? <laughs> and double face plant. All right. All right. So <laughs> it makes me laugh, right? Okay. Do you hear the story, though? Here's another pop quiz. In your heart of hearts right now, how old, how long ago did dinosaurs go extinct? 
Some of you have a worldview that says 65 million years when a six mile wide meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs and the only things left were the mice and the shrews that ate dino blood for a couple years waiting for the sun to come back out and it was the age of the mammals and then the mammals took over and the dinosaurs died out. You've heard that so many times. You can actually see the meteor hitting the earth. I've seen enough animations, Land Before Time, when, when my kids were young, right? Sarah, you're going the wrong way. Big, you know, every year. Parents always laugh at that, all right? So, seriously, how old or how long ago did the dinosaurs go extinct? All right, now, I just gave you that weird scenario about finding blood vessels inside of a dinosaur. You ask any pathologist and they'll say, under perfect conditions in a vacuum jar in liquid nitrogen, even then the cosmic rays are gonna dissolve proteins eventually. So even under the best conditions, they see after 50 years a degradation. So they could extrapolate and say, it would be white powder after about three, 4,000 years. There's no way tissue would still be stretchy and spongy after 65 million years. Okay? Now you know what the scientists have observed. Now I'm going to challenge your worldview. You've heard so many days, so many years, so many classes that the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. What's going to happen? Observational science? Tissue can't last that long? Or your worldview, who's going to win? Your worldview or observation? See, I'm challenging you, right? You might not like it, but I'm challenging you. Now, what do you think of that story? I asked my students that story. Kid raised his hand. He said, it's fake. Mm, that's one possibility. I got another one. Ready? What does it prove? And he said to me, he said, it proves that we didn't know how yet but blood vessels can last 65 million years in wet sandstone in the middle of bone marrow. And that's proof that it does. Whoa, is that a belief-saving device? You see what they did? The creationist in my room raised his hand and goes, that proves the earth is young. <laughs> he gets all excited, right? So that's a really cute story. But what if it really happened? Then it would challenge your worldview, wouldn't it? You know, it's not just a made-up story. I had a kid in the back. His name was Guy. And he said, I refuse to answer your question. I'm totally offended by your question. And I said, why is that, Guy? And he said, you're tricking me. I know your worldview. You're trying to mess with the truth. You're trying to mess with real science and come up with this fake story about blood vessels in a dino, in a T-Rex, just so that I'll be manipulated and persuaded to believe that somehow your religion is better than my science. I ain't falling for it. Whoa. Guy, I'm glad you feel that way. He had no idea how religious he was. He was dogmatic in his insistence that he wasn't going to answer my question. Until I showed this slide, which is showing you I wasn't lying, that, look, scientists recover T-Rex soft tissue. I got video of this. When it's stretched out, it comes back. Heck, my ham sandwich can't do that after a week in my fridge. <laughs> Stretchy, come back. Stretchy, come back. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Hey, want to know something else? If they want to keep their grant money, they're not going to change that title. 70 million year old fossil, no question about the age. How dare you? You'll lose your grant money. Yields preserved blood vessels. Guess where all the money is going to Mary, Mary Schweitzer, who discovered this. Guess where all the money is going? Where's all the funding going? To find the mechanism that preserves tissue for 70 million years. Nobody's allowed to think of another possibility, except there must be a preservation way that we didn't know about. Belief-saving device, belief-saving device, BS device. BS device. Isn't that scary? So look up dino blood for fun, for homework. 
<laughs> I'll quiz you next week. Okay? So to sum it all up here, <laughs> same input, fossil, <laughs> but it depends on your worldview on whether or not uh, you see great evidence for creation or great evidence for evolution. And I can't change your mind. That's a philosophical problem. So naturalism is a religious worldview as far as I'm concerned. It's my opinion. No greater than any other interpretation of the evidence, yet in spite of the First Amendment, you guys are only hearing that one, and you should be upset. If you're an atheist, you should be upset. You're not getting educated. Much evidence that contradicts that worldview is being suppressed, and you're not going to ever hear this unless you sit here in this talk, and there's only 15 of you. The rest boycotted it. They said they were going to be here to poke holes in me, but they didn't show up. They're scared. I might mess with their worldview, and I might make sense. So they're not here. I'm glad you're here. I really appreciate you showing up, especially if you're a skeptic. I, I honor you for having the guts to be open-minded enough to at least hear another point of view. That's very commendable, and you should, uh, you should be proud of yourself for doing that. Okay? And there you go. If you only hear one possible explanation for an untestable historical event, are you being an educated or are you being indoctrinated? Ah, so the real question should be, what makes more sense? A creator designer? We have laws of logic. We have nature. We have uh, observational science that points to intelligence. All right? The other one doesn't really have anything to stand on. So it's not a question of the evidence. It's a question of the worldview. What worldview do you have, and can you justify it? I can justify mine. Can you justify yours? Okay? I love this one. God, if you're real, show me a sign. <laughs> and then all that nature, and then all that nature, and all that beauty, and all that design, and all that intelligence, and all that information. Oh, I'm waiting. You see, I can't change someone's mind. I can just point out the flaw in their worldview. Okay? Man, I really appreciate you taking the time to come here today. And I thank you so much. So... That's it for me. <laughs> Thanks. Now, what I think we do, if you want to hang out, come on closer. It's just a small group. Uh, I got a bunch of people that weren't able to talk because they actually are real professors. <laughs> Sorry, it's a joke from a bad email I got. Um, uh, so uh, feel free if you want to stay. I would love it. Just to, if you want to come down closer so we can be a little bit... Uh, more intimate, I will shut this microphone off because it's probably annoying you. And then um, ask me any questions. If you want to stay where you are and ask questions, if uh, you want to have other people come up, Jeremy, if you want to. Yeah, I know, but it's so small. Can we actually set up I saw. I saw. It's so informal, though. It's just too scary. I don't want to sit okay. behind a bunch of chairs behind this. Who are the men behind the curtain? So if you'd like to stay or ask questions, feel free. Yeah, but just ask me for the procedure, whatever. I actually have a Geneseo, which is really cool. He's the only guy I know. Because didn't you write your doctorate degree about uh, multidimensional stuff? Yeah. He's the only guy I know who can actually envision five dimensions. I'm stuck with three. I'm having trouble with time. And then this guy's got five or six in his head. He's my hero. Jeremy Stid is a philosopher extraordinaire. And so he's really got some great apologetic information to share with you. But more of a logical way instead of just this nerdy science stuff that I do. Jeremy works a lot with uh, people talking about just worldview, talking about philosophy, and talking about logic. And the rules that people seem to break sometimes when they uh, talk about uh, their worldview and how well, everybody believes this whole must be true. You know, it's a little illogical um, uh, discrepancy that people have. So, anything come to mind? tell you what radioactive dating truly is only. You have a whole bunch of elements. Let's pick one. Uranium. Okay? 
And then if you take a long time, long time for three rains, and you go through a sequence of turning into polonium and turning into all these other things, eventually the end product is lead. Okay? So here's what you do. You have to believe that the uranium that was there has a half-life or a decay rate. And you have to believe that in the past, the decay rate is exactly what we observe today. So assumption number one is the decay rate never changes. In the past, it's the same. Now, if the speed of light was different, the decay rate would be different. And there's evidence maybe that the speed of light might be decaying in time if we move faster than the past. I don't know. Uh, that's kind of sketchy. I wouldn't bet my life on that one. Okay? But there has been known observations with gamma bombardment, with neutrino stuff going on, where radioactive decay rates are constant, like we've been told since we were five. So assumption number one, the decay rate has always been what it is today. So if somebody tells you the half-life of uranium is four and a half billion years, they're saying they believe the last four and a half billion years, <laughs> it's been that way, and it's like popcorn. Like you give it a certain amount of time, uranium's gonna decay into lead eventually, okay? Here's another one. You have to believe that all the lead you see in the sample used to be uranium. You cannot assume that there might have been some lead in the beginning. So if you want to believe that you can date rocks, you have to assume that there was not any lead in the original sample, and all the lead you see used to be uranium. You follow me on this one? Now, if you don't believe that, that's great. Now you have to believe there was no lead that got brought in from outside and no uranium that was taken away from the outside. So you believe it was a closed system, effectively, where no uranium could get in or out and no lead could get in and out. See those assumptions? Now, Tim, if you believe those four assumptions wholeheartedly, religiously, because you've heard it and heard it and heard it from people that had doctor's degrees, then you will now believe you can date a rock. Get it? Because you know the half-life, and you know how much uranium you got now, and how much lead you got now. Do a simple little calculation, you tell me how long that rock's been sitting there after it got cooled off and solidified. Beautiful, huh? So I don't call the words radioactive dating off. I just call it radioactive isotope observation. Because all I know is daughter element, parent element. But I don't know if somebody came in the room in the middle, you know, there's an analogy I give where I say, you know, there's like this guy peeling potatoes, and he peels one potato in a minute, and he puts those potatoes over here after they've been peeled. And you walk in the room and you go, oh, there's four potatoes that have been peeled. And there's three potatoes that haven't been peeled yet, and he's peeling one of them. How many minutes has he been peeling? He peels one a minute. And you read it say, oh, he's been peeling for four minutes. Are you sure? Absolutely, right? And then I show the video where somebody came in and grabbed <laughs> three of the potatoes because they're making food over here and they took away from his already peeled stuff. Somebody else brought more potatoes in. Oh, see, you assume that none of that happened, okay? Then you see the video he peeled the first one real slow. And he peeled the one you were watching one per minute. See all these assumptions? So, if you want to embrace those assumptions, yeah, right after day is great. Except for one problem, guys. Mount St. Helens dome blew up, and all this magma spewed out, and they radioactively dated that with three different methods and came with up to 100,000 years. So, it didn't happen in that. Why are we still saying that that's a viable dating method? Because you want to believe your belief system, and I'm messing with it from Mount St. Helens. Boy, did that screw up a lot of people. Mount St. Helens ruined the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Mount St. Helens ruined polystrata trees. You know about polystrata trees? They're uh, petrified wood that's through more than one layer. Wait a minute, I thought there was a million years of these layers. Polystrata trees are through many layers. 
that they're old. Okay? And so all those trees sit, stand there and floated, and then they got waterlogged. And the bulb of the tree, the heavy part, went down. Now they bop this way. Right? And then after a while, they got more waterlogged and they stuck to the bottom. And if there was another eruption, it made another layer. of a liquidy solution with a bunch of minerals under high pressure, like you buried it under a lot of sediment. And they put the pressure on there, and you know what? It's like marinating your steak. Except they're marinating the wood, and all these things take over where the wood used to be, and it fills in the cell wall with rocks. And out comes that thing that rock that looks just like wood. No treating, no staining. How long does it take to make a petrified tree? Four hours. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I went off. <laughs> Come on, ask me another one. What else is new? Why are you here, man? It's freezing out. Who's my hero? You're taking notes. Is it for a class? Yeah, just for the you, ask, video ask camera. Anything for, uh, anything for uh, Mr. Math? <laughs> anybody, anybody else? We're here just to support him in case there's a question. That's how oh, that's yes, sir. Yeah, oh, those are awesome. Um, I wish I, I brought that. It's just the coolest thing. Uh, the ice core samples, they'll tell you how old it is with the assumption that it's like tree rings, that every row, every layer is a year, which is odd because I got a picture from my car that made 15 layers in one hour. <laughs> now, I jest with that one. That, that's a funny little thing. But uh, I do have pictures of a 1940 plane, 42 plane during the war that went down and it was buried under, I think it was like 1,500 layers of ice since 1940. The weight of the plane just kind of oozed its way down into this glacial thing. And it's just fascinating to me because they're still teaching students that they're like tree rings, that every year is a layer. Where'd they get that from? Right? So it's really a weird assumption, but it works to their advantage because then they can tell you how old this ice is and these core samples, how old they are. And uh, observational science doesn't agree with what they're teaching students, but you know that's what they're doing. So ice core samples are really an interesting thing. I got some really cool pictures of that airplane that they dug out of 1,500 layers. It's just wild, it's really cool. But uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I love that picture. I mean, this plane is so far under, it's creepy to see this plane from 1940 buried under that much ice, right? So, uh, so how did they build a 1942 plane? <laughs> Aliens did it. <laughs> 1,500 years ago, years ago they, the aliens uh, did the plane. Was it, you know, it's the time travel thing. Captain America, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> I love it. All right. Yes, sir. I know you. I didn't see you there. Thanks for coming. Uh, no, don't say, don't, you just, you just did a crazy thing to me. If you're scientific, you'll believe in science. You just made it a religion. No, let's try it a different way. Let me, can, can I reword it for you? All right. I have people who are religiously, um, scientific naturalism. I would call that a religious belief, 
because there's a lot of evidence for design and a lot of evidence for intelligence that they have to find a belief-saving device in order to cope with their... But when you say scientist, I'm a scientist. I know when my science stops. Okay. <laughs> I just wouldn't use the word science. Mm -hmm. Okay, was there a question in that? Because that was awesome, but... <laughs> All right. My point is, trying to disprove each other is counterproductive, but trying to bring people to an understanding that it takes faith for both extremes, or both sides, and that there is, you know, I grew up reading the Bible and believing no one's ark and all that kind of stuff, but as a young child, I realized there's an indisputable proof that there were dinosaurs. Well, I see your point. The only thing I want to just check you on is you're saying those who believe in science and those who believe in creation. If you're here for my talk, you'd know that <laughs> that I, I'm I'm a proponent of real science, which is observational, testable science. And so I catch people. All right, let me talk. Huh? You did good. All right, let me talk. All right. All right. But what I'm saying is that you can still search for a better explanation than what they got you. And just even if you believe that the earth was really, really old, we still go out and have a beer together. I'm just saying that there is more evidence for a young earth than an old earth. And as a scientist, I follow the evidence. And you might not, because you're not a scientist, but you might embrace certain preconceived notions based on how you were indoctrinated without even knowing you're indoctrinated. And I talk, I talk, do these talks to try to get people to at least challenge their worldview, you know, and maybe you change it, maybe you don't. Maybe we have a greater discussion later when you feel more comfortable and we're one-on-one. -on -one. Give me a call and we'll do lunch. But the point being that there's a difference between operational science and what people are using that word to me, they're degrading the word, and anybody who says they have faith in science, no, it's not science they have faith in. They have faith in their religious belief, and they're disguising it as science, and that irritates me when I have students that are being fooled and indoctrinated into thinking, well, this is science, so I have to believe it, when it's a religious worldview disguised as science, and they don't have to believe it, and that's all. But... Let me just have Jeremy say. Yeah, more let me, because you stepped into a realm that, well, first of all, you have to define your terms, like faith. I mean, people's idea of faith, if you're going to come from a naturalistic point of view, is just going to be mostly kind of suppress whatever and just believe. And I like what you brought up, that there's a lot of mystery in both theology as well as science. And a lot of times we mistake contradiction and mystery and I'm going to kind of touch on that when when I give my presentation and I think we need to be open and sensitive just like uh, we, we don't need to be too dogmatic but at the same time 
I think logic does an intelligence. It's it's what what Lenny didn't have time to do. I'm going to do is we can also test our presuppositions. And logic isn't necessarily a great tool to kind of inductively prove anything, but it's a phenomenal tool to falsify something. And so a lot of times when something just isn't working, like we're not going to try to mix oil and water anymore, we're just not going to do it. And But at the same time, I, I agree with what you're saying at the same time, because but what he's dealing with and, and what you're dealing with, I, I, I agree with what you're saying about it, because I don't think Christians sometimes they get so afraid to keep an open mind to to try to understand where this individual is coming from. And we try to speak too quickly. And for me, it's just like, well, I'm going to call you out on your philosophical presuppositions. I'm going to call you out that if you're a naturalist, then how does how do you even get to intelligence in the first place or something like that? So that's just kind of something that we want to kind of just define our time. Um, just just to clarify one thing that Lynn was talking about, just so that I want to make sure everyone in here understands whether you're a Christian, a non-Christian, a naturalist, or whatever. One of the main points that we're trying to get across when we come and visit schools like this, and, and it's kind of why Lenny jump, jumped on you, I think, maybe a little too harshly, but, but, but I know, but... but um, so many people say it's Christianity versus science or creation versus science. And we want to get rid of that word science in there because that's not what it is. It's, it's creation or maybe Christianity versus naturalism. Science supports both sides. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and that, that's actually the danger is using it as that generic term because it makes it seem like it is science versus creation, where it's really creation versus naturalism, and science is in the middle of that. With a different rule book. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. Yes, sir. Um, well, are they both Christian? Yeah. Uh, people have uh, worldviews uh, and dogma and belief systems that go against each other. And like I said in my talk, this really has nothing to do with science, right? Okay, so here you have a Christian Catholic named Copernicus, and then you have a Christian Catholic who's trying to stomp him out, right? Because maybe his model was the one that they were using at the time. So humans, man... Man, nothing like ruining good science than by putting some humans involved, right? Because they're prejudiced and they're dogmatic and, uh, and they'll want to keep their worldview, their belief system, no matter what you do. So that's a great observation that you just made. I don't know if you've got Wikipedia hiding there or something, but uh, there you go. <laughs> Smartphones. Right? So, uh, I mean, think about it. I mean, that's a great example of two people that are actually, you would think would be on the same side, you know, you know, the Bible, you know, and then here you got these two guys that both believe in the Bible. One guy's kind of like slamming the other guy saying, no, 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 no new theory. Mine's fine. Or the one we got is perfect. You should believe you. Have you ever read on what belief system they had before Copernicus? It's hysterical. I mean, they had uh, uh, the earth in the center and then all the, you know, the moon and the sun and Mercury and Venus and everything. And then when the observations started coming in that contradicted it, they had a belief-saving device. Okay, hold on. Mercury and Venus are going around the sun, and then the sun goes around the earth. Okay, that saved everything. Yeah, we still got phases of, the, of Venus and moon. And see, that's why Mercury and Venus never leave the sun, because they're going around the sun, but the sun goes around us once a day. And then Mercury, uh, Mars had retrograde motion. And they're like, oh, whoa, Mars just stopped in Gemini and went back through Taurus and then back through Gemini. What the heck is that? We can't explain that with our model. Copernican model, you could, but they can't with my, oh, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Do we change our worldview? No. Okay, we're going to put circles in the circles. So we got epicycles. So actually Mars is going around itself in about four months 
while it's going around us once a day. See what I mean? They just save their belief system, save their beliefs, and we're all guilty of it, okay? It's really interesting. You know, you got two people that are supposedly both, I don't know, Catholic, whatever that, you know, means, but it's kind of, it's kind of neat where you got this one guy who's a, you know, believer and another guy who's a believer, and they're just still arguing it all out. It happens in my realm, too, man. You should see the people who are, uh, believe that the earth is four and a half billion years old get all nasty and mean to somebody who might embrace a younger earth model and has evidence for it. And then they got evidence for the old earth and they are arguing it. You know, it would be the same story if they wrote a story and put it on Wikipedia 400 years from now about, um, uh, what's his name? Hugh Ross versus Ken Ham. You know, it would be, it would be in Wikipedia in 400 years. This is really cool. Yes, sir. Excellent. I, I didn't know if you wanted me to bring that up, but as, as long as you did, thank you so much. Uh, I love this little history. That's why I'm writing this book about the scientific ma method. There's a rumor going around that Galileo actually had this beginning of religion or faith versus science. Poor Galileo was agreeing with Copernicus and the religious people, the Pope and the boys, snuffed him out, made him recant, saying, if you want to get out of house arrest, you got to recant. Now, some of that's true, but let me tell you the real, the real history. The real history is what this gentleman said. Copernicus had perfect circles, and so it didn't work as good as the crazy stuff I just described. Now, if you were the Pope, whether you like it or not, the Pope was in charge of giving out the money, <laughs> right? And the Pope has to be the judge, and so the judge says, look, I can't embrace the Copernican model. He's saying this to Galileo, his best friend. So the Pope and Galileo are like tight, you know? And he's saying to Galileo, look, I kind of agree with you. I think Copernicus is right, but the model doesn't fit observation as well as what we already have. I can't dump what we already have to go with a model that doesn't work as well. That's not good uh, protocol for science. I got to keep the old until you can come up with a better new. And Galileo was a narcissistic jerk. He knew he was right. Now he was right, but he was nasty about it. Not very Christian if you were going to stereotype the guy. And he got so mad at the Pope for not just blanketly saying Galileo was right in agreeing with Copernicus and dumping everything Galileo made a three-act play with three guys, and one of them had a really big, funny hat on, and his name was Stupidicus. And they argued about what was in the middle, Earth or the Sun, Earth or the Sun, and Stupidicus argued that the Earth was in the center, and then the other two made him look more stupid than even his hat. What kind of hat was he wearing? Well, it looked a whole lot like the Pope's hat. Right? The Pope says, hey, what are you doing to me? Hey, I'm your best friend. You know, what's your, what's, you know, so pretty much he humiliated the Pope and that's why he got under house arrest and he made him recant out of pride more than disagreeing with the worldview. Thank goodness there was another born again young earth creationist by the name of Kepler who turned it into ellipses and got lucky because it was just a little bit of an ellipse on Mars but he turned it into an ellipse. The model worked better, and the scientific community and the church embraced it wholeheartedly because it was it. So when people who don't know history judge me, oh, wait, you're, Christ you're like one of them flat earthers. How ironic that it was the Christians that got us out of the flat earth model. How ironic it was that the Christians are the ones that got us out of the earth being in the center of the solar system. That's just ironic because I get accused of being a flat earth, archaic person because uh, their religious beliefs judge my religious beliefs as inferior because their religious beliefs believe that they have science in their court. Yeah. Say again, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, and then we ignored them. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I don't know if you know about this, but uh, Aristotle said anything at rest wants to remain at rest, anything in motion wants to re come to rest. So once everybody believed that worldview, that paradigm, then, then 
you can't explain the planets moving around the sun. You'd have to have God's giving them a push all the time, right? And Galileo rolled balls around the floor and said, nope, anything in motion wants to keep on going. So that means we don't have to keep pushing them planets around. It's pretty cool if they just start, somehow they got it started, now they're going to go forever, you know? And uh, it's really kind of neat that this observational science trump any of this Greek stuff. But I don't know if people know the story, but there was a guy in Greek times called Aristarchus. And he said, I think the earth is not in the center. I think the sun is in the center. I think the earth is just rotating on its axis. And that's why it looks like the sun's going around us. And everybody said, hold on, let's ask Aristotle. And Aristotle said, did you hear what Aristarchus just said? He's saying that the earth is not in the center and that we're on a, you know, they knew it was a globe, but they just figured the sun was going around the globe, you know? And, and, uh, and Aristarchus <laughs> said that we were the third rock from the sun back in Greek times. And Aristotle had so much clout that Aristotle said, Aristarchus, there's a, there's a bird on a tree. And the bird wants to fly off the tree and grab a worm at the bottom. If you're right and the earth is spinning, then the bird leaves the perch. And while he's flying down, the whole tree goes that way with the worm. And, and you know, the bird ends up in Syracuse. Right? You know why? He already got everybody to believe that anything in motion wants to come to rest. And once you believe that, then everything moves, but the bird stops moving with the tree. So it was his proof that the earth couldn't be spinning because his belief system, non-tested, got everybody convinced if it was spinning, the bird would end up in a different city. And therefore, that's proof it didn't move. Is that crazy? Because they believed that anything in motion wants to come to rest they immediately had to assume the earth couldn't be spinning. And poor Aristarchus, <laughs> everybody looked at him probably and said, well, and he's like, never mind, you know? And so it, it was another 1,500 years before somebody had the nerve to repeat what the Greeks actually had come up with. It's crazy history, man. It's crazy. It's uh, human beings always getting in the way of good science, man. How are we doing? <laughs> yes, sir. saying that there's more harm that has come to the world because of religion, because of Christianity, <laughs> uh, to people. I mean, there have been, you know, certain races. Crusades, and, uh, yeah. A lot of different things have occurred throughout history. We were thrown into dark ages where science, the scientific method was largely ignored because of a dominant philosophy. And so a lot of these people say, well, we need to abandon mm -hmm. that. We need to separate that from science. Mm -hmm. route, so we can continue to progress and get better as a society. We better not listen to, mm. especially Christian. These superstitious, yeah. We're going to be, you know, you know, crucifying people and stoning people if we went by their values. Mm -hmm. So we really need to stay away from that. I know a lot of people will say that mm -hmm. there's a lot of harm. But truly, would it matter if we stuck with the creations? Let's just say we had one. Let's say creations were just thrown out the window, gone. Anyone who believed in, you know, young earth or creationism would just died or disappeared or and we just had natures. Would the world be better off mm. if we stuck with one worldview mm -hmm. rather than another? That's a great question. Jeremy's biting at the bit here. I'm not even looking at him. But right before I give it to him, I just let me make one really cool comment. Um, that is a uh, lie. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bullying technique. Uh, it's their world religion that they're trying to justify let's all agree with my worldview so that the world would be a better place and sing John Lennon songs, you know? Um, so that's not true. The statements you made that I've heard them make is not true. Richard Dawkins is spewing things that is not historically true. And to say that, it'd be interesting. There might become a day where they get their wish. <laughs> 
and we'll find out whether or not I happen to think all hell will break loose. But that's just my personal opinion. All right? But let me just let Jeremy share with you some of the facts, the facts about what religion or what worldview actually caused more damage. Yeah, first thing is when you get to the bare bone level of that, that science and morality don't mix. Science can just tell you how. Uh, morality is a why question, and science doesn't tell you why. Uh, it never gives out motive. It just displays reactions. Um, if a rock falls on someone, science will just tell you that it's going to hurt. <laughs> but they don't say why that rock falls or why should or should it not. Same thing with poison in someone's tea. Why, why would someone do that? Science cannot answer. It can tell you that it's going to severely affect your health if you drink it. But the problem is, is that that reaction from atheists, mostly by Christopher Hitchens, uh, the late atheist who promoted that, they actually were going to, he debated Dr. John Lennox, and he actually, they were going to pass a bill in England where if Christopher won that, they would have proposed a bill in Parliament to say that um, England is better without Christianity. And what happened is he would have had a gripe up to the 20th century. And then Hitler came along. And a lot of people say, well, Hitler was a Catholic, this, that. No, he wasn't. The only authority Hitler had was Hitler. <laughs> and Hitler did pretty much whatever he wanted. But let's jettison Hitler because he's too controversial. And you can go with Stalin. He killed 20 million of his own people. And then Mao made him look like a mouse. He killed double that. And pretty much then you have Pol Pot. Now who is really reeling on that side? And they all did it in the name of getting rid of religion. Mao said that there would be no vestiges of Christianity by the time he's done. And now China is one of the fastest growing Christian countries in the world, far albeit with a lot of persecution. So... What's that? He killed 40 million people in the name of no religion. And here's the problem at the end of the game, because it's human wickedness at this point. And if you don't, I mean, and this, this is where the, the big issue comes in, and this is where a lot of times you will never hear that. We'll say that religious cause, you know, religion causes wars, this, that, and the other. Really, when it comes down to it, it's truth versus error. But here's the big problem. The big problem is, is I can be a Christian and I can say those crusaders which did dastardly things and, and own up to it. I mean, Bernardo Clairvaux didn't do some very nice things. Uh, neither did the Muslims or anything else, but we're not here to, to talk about religion in that sense. But I can go to my scriptures and, and Jesus says right in John 18 that my kingdom's not of this world or my servants would have fought for me. And I could say those crusaders were going against biblical, you know, biblical principles. The question is, is what an atheism said what Stalin and Mao did was wrong? When everything is just random guided accident, you just have fatalistic events. You know, and, and, and that's where the conflict comes in. But also, I've seen people batter, I, as a Christian, I, and this is what hurts me, is I've seen Christians batter non-Christians with that type of truth, and it doesn't solve anything, is that still, even though that may be true, we have to remember that when you're bringing someone out of a worldview, there's a lot of intensity because that worldview was held with some very strong emotion. And I think we as Christians need to still be very, very gentle when we present that type of stuff because these are human beings. They're not objects for us just to mess with. And uh, they're just as sacred as I am or as anybody else. So uh, that would be my answer to your uh, inquiry. I hope that that helps a little bit. I'll just add one more thing to it because I, I think it's a great point. And it also brings up, I already talked about goal number one of Veritas Exchange, get, getting rid of this science versus Christian statement and it's naturalism versus Christianity. With, with, with you, Another one of our goals is, I guess, essentially the point, it's never a good idea to have only one point of view. <laughs> We're not trying to say evolution should not be taught. We're trying to say other things should be taught also. 
there has not been one scientific law that was right the first time they tried it. <laughs> From uh, planetary motion to Newton's laws of motion to Einstein's theory of relativity to his correction of that Einstein, Einstein's special theory of relativity. <laughs> There's never been a correct, complete model for anything scientifically. We always improve on it by having somebody that comes along and says, that's not right. And without more than one opinion, there is no scientific advancement. And that's, again, part of the reason why we do this is to not say evolution shouldn't be taught, but to say, you know what, there are about four or five explanations for how we came to be here, or for how the planets came to be here. And just and just one more thing is just the, that because we don't have exhaustive knowledge of anything either, I think that makes the stakes a little bit higher because we do. I mean, if our destiny is at stake here, we want to know as much as we can, and I think that breeds a lot of fear and. Uh, I think it breeds, that's what bred a lot of the skepticism of, of the Greek ages. He mentioned Greece a little bit a while ago. So, but at the same time, I, if you're going to adhere to a Christian worldview, the, the scripture says no knowledge, that, that word is actually there more than faith. And, um, and so I understand um, nobody wants to come to the end of their life and find out they were believing something that's not true. And it's not like some little event. I mean, this is what we're going to stake our life on. So we want to be as, in, as much in the know as we can. And I think as science and Christians, we both need to work together with both of those because he said it right. Science is, a, the, the Bible is not a, it's not a textbook. Just because scientific data, though, is absent from scripture, doesn't falsify the scriptures. And that's something that we have to kind of keep in mind. We have to just, we, we got to think and we have to constantly challenge those ideas because sometimes until we go through the actual historical event, for example, we really don't know the full fulfillment of a scriptural passage. You see that with Jesus and the disciples. I mean, they had no clue what a church was. You can you imagine what Peter thought when Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church? Peter's like, what's, what's a church? And that's 2,000 years worth of history we're talking about. So we got to really think and let, let's take a step back and let's, let's, as humans and as rational creatures as much as we can, let's talk about it because the stakes are pretty darn high. You guys done? Oh, one more. What you got? Uh, next week, uh, Dr. Sanford from Cornell is going to speak about a lot of the stuff, um, probably mostly with genetics and, uh, and bio kind of stuff. Yeah, no. So next week, same place, same time, same, 7 o'clock, next Tuesday. Dr. Sanford will be here. And then um, the week after that, the 18th, uh, Jeremy will speak on logic and cool philosophy stuff. So this is the first of three weeks. Thanks for coming, man. Yes, sir. Hold on, hold on. Say it a little bit louder. My ears are plugged. Yeah, I can't stand that religious stuff. <laughs> I, I would agree with it in the sense that I know where he's coming from when he said that. And he said that was long. You got that Wikipedia out. Why don't you look at what he said about the Nazarene? And while you're doing that, remember that he said, uh, what was it? Science without religion is lame. And religion without science is ignorant or dangerous. Or Yeah, that's a great quote. Superstition, yeah. Yeah, science without religion is lame and religion without science is... Dangerous superstition or something like that. It's really kind of a neat quote. But uh, later in his life, he uh, was pretty impressed with, uh, he mentions the gospel. Did you find it? Um, I'm looking at him on page 259. Something about, uh, something about, he said, I've been versed in the Talmud, but I'm also aware of the gospels. Something like that. 
do a search on that. Oh, he's waiting. <laughs> Any other quick questions? You guys are troopers, man. Do you have a long day at school too? Were you here all day? Yeah, it's great. So <laughs> you just woke up. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> I've been going since seven this morning teaching physics. So uh, getting here was tough, but uh, I was I was glad I came, and I really appreciate you guys for showing up because it was lousy out there, and uh, you're troopers, man. So I hope uh, you got something out of it, or at least something to think about. And uh, we really appreciate you showing up. If you can, tell your friends about Dr. Sanford showing up next week. And Jeremy did showing up on the 18th next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. And again, I really thank you guys for showing up. I'm really honored that you took the time away from your life to uh, listen to me talk.